Star Trek began as a hybrid of genres. Gene Roddenberry's now legendary pitch for the show as Wagon Train to the Stars speaks to this. It's superficially a science fiction show, what with being set aboard a spaceship in the future and such, but there's also a lot of Western in its premise, its plots, its characters. And every once in a while, the creators of the various Star Trek shows have said, screw it, and produced episodes that are pretty much just straight-up Westerns. Spectre of the Gun on Classic Trek, A Fistful of Datas on TNG, North Star on Enterprise, Far From Home on Discovery. But while the Western is the genre other than sci-fi that is the most visible across the many incarnations of Star Trek, it's not the only other category to which the franchise has occasionally paid a visit. There's another genre Star Trek has dabbled in, a popular one, one that has mingled frequently with sci-fi throughout the history of literature, film, and television. I can think of several examples of said dabbling, and we're going to talk about a few of those in this video, because while some of the episodes Star Trek has produced within this particular genre have been memorable, I can't help but ask the question, is Star Trek actually any good at horror? So, horror is the genre I was talking about. I was being cute about it to get to the bit where I say the title, but I don't want there to be any confusion going forward. We're talking about horror-themed Star Trek episodes. The original series produced several episodes with characters, plots, and various tropes borrowed from the horror genre. The very first episode ever broadcast, The Man Trap, has the crew being stalked by a shape-shifting alien that murders people for their body's salt content. But the episode of TOS that is probably most remembered as being a horror episode is from Season 2, and it's titled Cat's Paw. The Enterprise is in orbit above the planet Pyrus 7, and Captain Kirk is on edge because of the landing party he sent down, consisting of Scotty, Sulu, and some redshirt nobody, hasn't checked in for a while. Finally, they get a message from the surface. Redshirt nobody here, want to beam up. So, they beam him up, and Kirk meets him in the transporter room because he wants to ask him, hey, what happened to Scotty and Sulu? But... When Redshirt Nobody materializes on the transporter pad, he just falls over dead. Kirk's like, great, he'll never answer my question now. But another voice speaks from the dead shirt's mouth and says, Captain Kirk, your ship is cursed. Leave at once or you will all die. Kirk decides the best way to handle this is to beam himself and the other two most important officers on the ship down to the planet to see what's going on. So Kirk, Spock, and McCoy beam down, and pretty soon they run into some witches. And the witches are like, didn't you hear what the dead guy said? You're cursed. Get out of here. Only they speak in rhyme, so it's more like, roses are red and sometimes are yellow. Remember the curse or you'll be dead, fellow. The witches disappear, and Spock's like, that was weird. Anyway, I'm reading life forms up ahead. So they push through a strong gust of wind and walk on until they come to a spooky castle. Spock confirms that the life forms he detected are somewhere in the structure, so they make their way inside. This episode originally aired three days before Halloween, by the way. It's the closest Star Trek has ever come to an outright holiday special. None of the shows ever did, like, a Christmas episode or Thanksgiving episode or anything like that. And I think that's a shame. Sure, it's cheesy, but since when has Star Trek ever been bothered about that? <laughs> You're producing an episode that's going to air around a particular holiday, so you write it to evoke things related to that holiday. It's nice for the folks watching, you know? In fact... Cat's Paw was the first episode produced for Star Trek's second season, but it wasn't aired until late October because of its Halloween-themed content. And that just makes sense, right? Can you imagine making a horror-themed episode and not releasing it to coincide with Halloween? I mean, I'm sure it's been done, but... Jesus, can you imagine being that oblivious? 
Anyway, they walk into this castle, and there's a black cat, and the cat's like, fuck you, and runs away. And Kirk shrugs it off. And why not? It's just a cat acting like a cat. And they keep exploring. They walk around some more, they run into the cat again, and the cat's like, I said fuck you! And the three of them fall through a trapdoor again. Typical cat behavior. Kirk, Spock, and McCoy are chained to the wall of a dungeon. Scotty and Sulu come walking in like a couple of zombies. The old-fashioned mind-controlled kind. Not the brain-eating kind. Unshackle Kirk, Spock, and McCoy, and start to walk them toward the door. There's a bit of a scrap as they fight over the phaser Scotty is holding, but then, suddenly, they're all transported to another part of the castle. And there's this dude, Korob, who's like, hey, knock it off. They argue for a bit about what each of them is doing on this planet. While they argue, the cat keeps meowing at Korob, and Korob keeps replying, like he understands what the cat is saying. Typical cat owner behavior, but Kirk, Spock, and McCoy think it's weird. Korob's like, I've been a bad host. Here, have some food. And he magics the table full of food. Kirk's like, we're not hungry. So Korob says, fine, then maybe you'd like precious jewels. And he magics them a bunch of gemstones. Kirk's like, it's the future, son. We have a gemstone making machine on our ship. We've got closets full of this crap. It's worthless to us. So Korob says, hey, congratulations, you passed the test. McCoy's like, what test? Like a blood test? A pregnancy test? A cerebrospinal fluid test? Because I'll tell you right now, if you try a lumbar puncture on me with that magic wand, you're going to have a fight on your hands. Korob's like, no, no, these were all tests of character, see? Your determination to rescue your crewmates shows loyalty. Your refusal to be frightened away shows bravery. Your rejection of the food and the jewels shows you can't be bribed. Yeah, you seem like good people. Good, helpful, cooperative people. That's you all over. The cat walks out of the room, then walks back in, only now she's a lady. And she's like, hey, in case you were wondering, controlling your minds is super easy. Just thought you'd want to know. And Kirk is like, thanks, and grabs Scotty's phaser. And then we learn that Cat Lady, whose name is Sylvia, is fucking hardcore. She produces a Christmas tree ornament of the Enterprise and holds it over a candle flame. Then she gives Kirk his communicator and says, call your ship, see what's up. Kirk calls the Enterprise and talks to Lieutenant DeSalle, who is in command because, God forbid, they put Uhura in charge of the damn thing. And DeSalle is like, hey, it's getting really hot up here. Kirk says, reroute power to the AC, but that doesn't work, so Kirk's like, give me that, snatches the Enterprise ornament away from Sylvia. That does the trick, and things aboard the ship cool back down to normal. Korob's like, well, you've seen what we can do, now tell us what you can do. Kirk's like, no. Sylvia says, you know, we could just take the information we want out of your brains, but that'll hurt, and it'll be a lot of work, so can you just tell us? Kirk's like, uh, no. So they send Kirk and Spock back to the dungeon while they have a chat with McCoy. Spock's like, I think I know what's going on here. Korob and Sylvia are creating all these things from the universal myths of humanity. Ghosts, witches, haunted castles. They're all drawn from the human subconscious. Kirk's like, yeah, maybe they were trying to tap our conscious minds but they missed and hit the subconscious instead. Spock's like, eh, works for me. Sulu and Scotty return with McCoy, who has been zombified. Sulu unchains Kirk and takes him upstairs. They walk in on Korob and Sylvia having a fight, and pretty soon after Kirk gets there, Korob leaves, taking the zombies with him. Sylvia's like, look, I come from a world without sensation, but now I'm a woman and I am all about it, so I want to join my mind with yours so we can share everything and know each other's secrets, because I think I would be hugely into that. They start making out. Kirk's like, so tell me about your people? And Sylvia's like, oh, we look way different, but we can take different forms thanks to the transmuter. Kirk's like, transmuter, eh? Tell me more. But Sylvia catches on and pulls away from his embrace, and she's like, You just want me to tell you things about us? You were using me! Kirk's like, Might as well be mad at a frog for catching flies, baby. It's just what I do. Kirk gets sent back to the dungeon, but Korob runs in and lets Kirk and Spock go. 
He tells them they have a chance to escape while Sylvia is distracted with trying to destroy everything. Kirk's like, I don't love that. But Korob says that Sylvia's in charge and she's acting irrationally and can no longer be controlled. Uncontrollable, irrational, actually the one in charge of everything. Check, check, check. Yeah, sorry, she just sounds like a cat. Korob, Kirk, and Spock make a run for it. Sylvia transforms into a giant cat and chases after them. They wind up back in the dungeon where Korob gets crushed to death when Sylvia breaks down the door. Kirk grabs Korob's magic wand, which is the transmuter, and he and Spock escape by jumping up through the trap door. Sylvia, in human form once again, shows up and magics herself and Kirk into the other room. And she's like, give me the magic wand. Kirk's like, which magic wand? This one? And he smashes it. There's a flash of light, and when it clears, the castle is gone, and everyone is back to normal. McCoy's like, what's going on? Kirk's like, that'll take some explaining. Hey, check that out. And on the ground in front of them are Korob and Sylvia in their true forms. And it turns out they're little fuzzy bugs with squid faces. Spock says something about taking them back to the Enterprise to study them, but the little fuzzy bugs turn to smoke, and Spock's like, never mind. And that's the end of the Star Trek Halloween special! It's a fun show, lots of horror movie stuff, but it's all pretty corny. Even the characters aren't that impressed with it, which is part of the point of the episode. Korob goes, check out my spooky castle! And Kirk's just like, eh, whatever. Cat's Paw is horror-themed but it's not really trying to scare us. For an episode that aims for a less tongue-in-cheek, more straightforward form of horror, we need to jump to the next generation. There are several TNG episodes that could qualify as belonging to the horror genre, including Season 7's Genesis, where Picard and Data leave for a few days to chase down a rogue photon torpedo and return to find that the crew has de-evolved into more primitive, animalistic life forms except Riker, who's strangely unaffected. Not a good episode, but a fun one, and lots of spooky shots of darkened Enterprise corridors. But the episode I'm going to focus on next comes from TNG's sixth season, Schisms. The episode bold enough to portray the existential nightmare that ensues when you miss out on a good night's sleep. The first one afflicted is Commander Riker, who shows up late for a briefing in engineering and is like, so what are we doing, mapping a star cluster or something? And Jordy and Data talk about some of the science stuff they want to do. Then Data says, don't forget about my poetry reading today. And Riker's like, God, that's, I am so looking forward to that. Yes, just try and stop me from attending your poetry reading. Fuck, let's go. Cut to Data's poetry reading, and I guess everybody must be cranky due to sleep deprivation, because they're all sitting there bored and impatient, despite the fact that Data's poems are objectively amazing. Seriously. I know the joke is meant to be, oh, Data's a robot, he doesn't understand emotions, so his poems are technically perfect but lack soul. Jordy basically says that to him in a later scene, but you know what? Fuck you, Jordy. Data's poems are good. And if the one about his cat doesn't evoke an emotional response, maybe you're the one who doesn't have a soul. Ever think about that? And though you are not sentient, Spot, and do not comprehend, I nonetheless consider you a true and valued friend. It's fucking art, man. Anyway, Riker falls asleep during the poetry reading. He goes to sickbay afterward, like, Hey, I don't know what's going on. I fall asleep okay. I think I'm sleeping through the night, but when I wake up in the morning, I'm always tired. Dr. Crusher prescribes warm milk. Riker is skeptical, but Crusher tells him, hey, it's a natural sedative. That's all you need. I mean, it's not like you're losing sleep because you're being abducted to a pocket dimension by aliens from another universe. <laughs> that is what it is, though. Riker's sleep disorder persists, and other members of the crew start reporting weird symptoms. Geordi gets an infection around his visor implants. Data discovers he has missing time. Plus, 
They're having irrational and seemingly unprovoked fear responses to mundane objects on the ship. Worf gets uncomfortable around a pair of scissors. Riker feels weirded out when he sits down at one of the forward consoles on the bridge. So Troy, in a rare instance of her having a part to play in the episode that actually relates to the thing which is theoretically her job on the ship, gathers a few of the crew members who have had these experiences together and gets them to talk about it. They all seem to be vaguely half-remembering the same experience. They go to the holodeck to see if they can visualize what they're all talking about, and gradually, with everybody throwing in suggestions, they build up a representation of this spooky place they all feel like they've been. A dark room, with a metal table, with a restraining brace and a swinging arm with a scissor-like tool attached to the end of it. And, coming from somewhere in the darkness, noises. Clicking noises. And Riker's last words were, what's that clicking noise? Henry Cho? Anyone? Moving on. They figure out that crew members are being abducted somehow by someone and taken somewhere when they check the internal sensors and find two people missing, Lieutenant Hagler and Ensign Rager. Hagler is eventually returned, reappearing in his quarters with his blood replaced by polymer, which does not seem fun for him. The senior staff has a meeting and Worf's like, we should build a homing device and slap it on someone so when they're abducted, we can trace them back to wherever they're being taken. Riker volunteers to wear the homing device, and Deanne is like, that's brave of you, but Riker's like, not really, they keep taking me anyway, so I might as well wear an ankle bracelet when they do. It won't be an ankle bracelet, it'll be one of those gimmicks we stick on your arm. Whatever, goddammit! Crusher gives Riker a stimulant to keep him awake after the aliens abduct him, and sure enough, that night, a portal opens in his quarters and he gets poltergeisted into another dimension. Riker winds up on a table like the one they made on the holodeck, and sure enough, there are some scary aliens here, dressed in hooded robes and just clicking away. Ensign Rager is here too, so Riker picks his spot, then jumps up, zaps one of the aliens with a phaser, and picks up Rager. Meanwhile, back on the Enterprise, Geordi's trying to close the subspace rupture that has been linking the Aliens universe with the Enterprise. It's almost completely closed when Riker and Rager jump back through. Later, Geordi explains that the aliens had a molecular structure so exotic that they couldn't exist in our universe, which is why they had to create a little pocket of our universe in their laboratory so they could study the people they abducted. Data says maybe they were just curious. And Riker's like, curious? Lieutenant Hagler is dead. They turned his blood to polymer, and now he's dead. He was a life. He mattered. What was his first name? The fuck am I supposed to know that? Schisms isn't often remembered as one of the best episodes of TNG, and it's really not, but it definitely has its moments, especially when we're specifically looking at it from the horror angle. The idea of being taken in your sleep to some strange place, being subjected to experiments, retaining no clear memory of it, but being reminded of it in ways that bring it out somewhat while leaving it mostly out of reach in the dark. That's a scary idea. The scene with all of them on the holodeck, piecing their experience together from feelings and fragments of memory is pretty effective. And I'm impressed that the writers found a way to pull off an alien abduction story on a series where the characters live on a spaceship and meet aliens all the time. Nicely done. Serving the rest of the franchise, we find other standout horror episodes like Deep Space Nine's Empok Nor, which sees several of our heroes embarking on a mission to scavenge an abandoned Cardassian space station. Once on board, Garrick is exposed to an experimental drug that turns him into a serial killer. There's a lot of cat and mouse through darkened corridors, and it's fun to see Andrew Robinson back in Scorpio mode for one episode, reminding us that for as morally complex a character as he is, if push comes to shove, Garrick will straight up kill a dude, or a bunch of dudes even, and enjoy himself thoroughly while doing it. 
Enterprise has a few episodes that fit the scope of our examination. My personal favorite is Impulse from the show's third season. It's basically a zombie movie with Vulcans as the zombies. And this time, I do mean zombie in the modern sense. Not literally. The Vulcan zombies in Impulse aren't undead flesh eaters, but they are violent, murder-happy characters. And I'm saying that's close enough. Speaking of which, the more horror movie-ish sequences of the film Star Trek First Contact also bring zombies to mind. Lily even refers to the Borg as cybernetic zombies at one point, and she's pretty spot on. They lurch around, they're slow, but they'll get you with their overwhelming numbers, and if they bite you, you become one of them. That's a zombie, buddy. Star Trek Discovery has dipped its toe into horror a time or two. The third episode of the first season, Context is for Kings, sees the crew exploring an abandoned ship and being pursued by a monstrous creature that turns out to be a giant tardigrade. Oh, sure, they're cute when they're microscopic, but what are you going to do when it grows up, huh? There's also a strong dose of body horror in the second season episode, Through the Valley of Shadows when Captain Pike touches a time crystal and confronts his destiny of being scarred and confined to a beep chair. That same episode also has a plot where Burnham and Spock investigate an apparently abandoned Section 31 ship that is actually under the control of the evil artificial intelligence known as... um... Control, which gives off some pretty heavy alien vibes. So yeah, good horror episode. And there are others from across the franchise I haven't mentioned. Feel free to share your favorite in the comments. But there's one more episode that I can't overlook. An episode that belongs near the top of any list of the best horror-themed episodes of Star Trek. It's an episode of Star Trek Voyager, which, as I have said many times, is my least favorite Trek series. Although this current season of Star Trek Picard is really giving it a run for its money. But this is an episode of Voyager I happen to like very much. In fact, I think it might be the best episode of Star Trek Voyager. It's from the second season, and it's called The Thaw. Neelix guides Voyager to a planet that used to be a trading post, but is just now recovering from an environmental cataclysm caused by a solar flare that altered its climate about 20 years ago. A scan of the surface reveals a handful of survivors in hibernation pods located deep underground. An automated message indicates the hibernation cycle was supposed to have ended four years ago, but they're still asleep. Well, Three of them are. The other two are dead. Janeway beams the hibernation pods aboard Voyager to see if they can figure out what went wrong, why these people didn't wake up on schedule. After examining the pods, Harry figures out that the brains of the hibernators have all been connected by the computer that controls the pods, creating an artificial environment like a shared dream to keep their minds active while they sleep. But the system wasn't set to automatically wake them up. Instead, it was designed to feed them information about the outside world so they would know when it was safe to leave the simulation. They have the power to wake themselves up at any time. They just haven't. Tom suggests that maybe they just like it in the simulation and don't want to leave. But the doctor doesn't think that's it, since the two hibernators who died seem to have died from fear-induced heart attacks. Chakotay suggests waking them up, but Harry's reluctant to do that since he has no idea how pulling them out of the simulation so abruptly would affect them. So Tuvok suggests using the two pods that had been occupied by the dead hibernators to enter the simulation and see what's going on. Janeway says, great idea, Tuvok, thanks for volunteering. But Tuvok's like, yeah, no, not it. Send in Harry and Balana. they're the ones who know the most about this sciency stuff. So they send Harry and Balana into the simulation, which seems like a happy place, I guess? Colorful? There are a bunch of Cirque du Soleil people around, but none of them are the hibernators, so Harry figures they're computer-generated characters, part of the fantasy. The guy in charge seems to be this clown, who is about to allow Harry to be guillotined when the three hibernators run in, led by Viorsa, who's like, hey... 
If you kill these guys, their people will definitely shut this whole thing down, so maybe don't. The clown agrees not to kill Harry and Bellana, but he also refuses to allow them to leave. See, the artificial environment is generated by the computer, but in order to work, it needs to interact with the living brains of the people in hibernation. If the people leave, the simulation ends, and the clown dies. However, Harry appeals to the clown to let one of them leave the system in order to inform Captain Janeway of the situation. Otherwise, Janeway could decide to just turn everything off. While the clown thinks it over, Harry and Bellana chat up the three surviving hibernators, who give them the skinny. The clown is the manifestation of fear, created by the computer system from the anxiety felt by the hibernators about their own survival. He basically runs the entire simulation now, and is responsible for killing the two dead hibernators. He cut their heads off in the guillotine, generating a strong enough fear response that they had fatal heart attacks. Also, he can read their thoughts, because their brains are plugged into the computer. So that's nice. The clown lets Bellana leave. Once she's gone, he has some fun with Harry, concocting torments based on Harry's deeply felt fears and insecurities, growing old, being perceived by his more experienced crewmates as a baby. This one time he wandered off in a hospital and saw some pretty messed up shit. Before that one can go too far, the doctor appears. He informs the clown that he's been sent into the simulation as a representative of Captain Janeway to negotiate for the release of Harry and the others. The clown isn't nuts about not being able to read the doctor's thoughts, but he listens to the offer release all the hostages, and they'll modify the system to run using a simulated brain. That way, the flesh and blood people can all be free, and the clown and the rest of his computer-generated people can continue to exist too. No way, says the clown. I don't know no simulated brain. Sounds to me like it wouldn't even work. Tell him, Viorsa. And Viorsa's like, oh, I don't know, it might work if you recalibrate the optronic pathways. Wink, wink, know what I mean? Recalibrate <coughs> the optronic pathways. Wink, wink. So the doctor leaves the simulation and talks it over with Janeway and Bellana. It turns out recalibrating the optronic pathways was some kind of secret message from Viorsa telling them how to disable the program. Bellana figures out that by disabling the system's optronic pathways, she can basically turn off the virtual environment one element at a time. And once it's all gone, the hibernators can be revived without having to worry about the clown killing them before they wake up or injuring them by pulling them out too fast. The doctor heads back in to distract the clown while Bellana does her thing, but the clown catches on and kills Viorsa because the whole thing was his idea. Janeway aborts the procedure, but now she's done fucking around. The doctor returns to the simulation one last time with an ultimatum. If the clown doesn't agree to release Harry and the two surviving hibernators within the next minute, Janeway will shut down the system, period. But if the clown agrees to the deal, he'll get to keep one person in the simulation. And that one person is Captain Janeway herself. Naturally, the clown agrees immediately. He lets Harry and the others go as Janeway appears, and he's just super excited that she's here. He looks at the two of them in a mirror and says, Don't we make a beautiful couple? And Janeway says, Ha, yeah. By the way, I'm not Captain Janeway. I'm just a hologram programmed to look and act like her. The clown's like, what? Hollow Janeway explains, the real Captain Janeway is connected to the system, so the clown can sense her presence, but she's not in stasis, which means she's not actually in the simulated environment. The clown's like, this is really not cool. Janeway tricked me. She lied to me. Now what's going to happen to me? And as the simulation begins to grow dark, Hollow Janeway says the same thing that eventually happens to all fear. You'll vanish. And the clown says pitifully, I'm afraid. I know. Fuck. Only it's broadcast TV, so he doesn't actually say fuck. He says draft, which is like the TV PG version of fuck. 
Captain Janeway conquers fear itself. And she must have really enjoyed taking the hands-on approach, because the very next episode is the one where she personally murders Tuvix. The doctor says, I can bring Tuvok and Neelix back, but doing it would kill Tuvix, and I'm not okay with that. So Janeway's like, I'll do it. Shove over. Let me at that console. Last week, I killed a computerized personification of fear and got me a taste of homicide, but now I am gonna eat! The Thaw is the kind of episode I wish Voyager did more often. It's a strong premise, well-paced with some clever but logical developments, like using the doctor to speak to the clown inside the simulation, and it ends at just the right moment on a memorable image, the clown's face melting into shadow. I like the idea of representing fear with a clown. I mean, what's scarier than a clown, right? And what makes clowns scary? Is it the fact that they're supposed to be funny, but they're not? And when that mirth transitions into cruel mirthlessness, it's absolutely blood-chilling to many of us? Yeah, I guess. Michael McKeon is fantastic as the clown, quick and funny, but unmistakably evil. The prospect of being trapped in a reality where he is in charge is truly terrifying. But ultimately, the clown himself isn't the source of the terror. It's what he represents. Fear. And that fear isn't something the hibernators discover once they're inside the simulation. It's something they bring in with them. It's an internal variation on the source of fear in the Empok Nor episode of Deep Space Nine. There, the source of fear isn't in the hero's own minds, but it is one of their own team. Garrick, their ally on this mission who has been corrupted. So the answer to the question, is Star Trek actually any good at horror, is yeah. Sometimes it's pretty great at it. The best horror episodes of Star Trek work because at their core, they're the same as all great horror stories. They remind us that for as frightening as the unknown can be, often the things we ought to be the most afraid of don't come from outside. They dwell within. That's what's truly scary. Almost as scary as it would be to live on a spaceship surrounded by people who are incapable of appreciating Data's cat poetry. God damn it, they should be so lucky to have poems like that written about them. Maybe if Kolob had written a poem like that about Sylvia, that situation would have turned out differently. Did you see that? How I brought it back around, tied it all together? That's talent. That's what that is. That's craft attention to detail. That's that's who you're dealing with, pretty much. I can't explain it, except to say that I've got a certain knack for... Did I just call him Kolob? Hey folks, hope you enjoyed this one. I'm gonna let you know what the subject of the next Trek Actually video is gonna be, but before I do that, I wanna give shout outs to some of my newest Patreon patrons and channel members. First, the new patrons. They are Chuck Two Guns. Thank you, Chuck. Fun Hom Ambo. Thank you, Fun Hom Ambo. Holly Putvin. Thank you, Holly. Nico. Thank you, Nico. Jonathan Hove. Thank you, Jonathan. Carol Cook, thank you, Carol. Zachary Shuford, thank you, Zachary. Chiron Owlglass, thank you, Chiron. Robert Bergman, thank you, Robert. Richard L. Spillers, thank you, Richard. Next, new channel members. Wolfie Basach, who upgraded his membership last month, thanks, Wolfie. And Jesus Martinez, who rejoined last month, thank you, Jesus. Those are the newest Patreon patrons to pledge $5 a month or more, and the newest channel members to join at the 5 bucks a month tier or higher. If you want to support this channel, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash steveshives and pledging any amount from a dollar a month on up, or clicking the join button to become a member of this channel. All patrons and members get access to exclusive posts that allow you to vote in the polls that determine upcoming Trek Actually topics, and also submit questions ahead of time for my twice-monthly Ask Away live streams. If you pledge 
$5 a month or more on Patreon, or become a member at the 5 bucks a month tier or higher, you get a shout out at the end of a Trek Actually video. I could not do this without the support of my patrons and my members. So to all of you who support this channel with a monthly contribution, thank you so much for enabling me to have this wonderful job. Of course, if you want to support this channel with a one-time gift rather than a recurring monthly contribution, you're always more than welcome to do that through PayPal or Venmo. The links to those are in the video description. And once again, if you want to help out on a regular basis, please go to patreon.com slash Steve Shives or just click the join button below the video. Many thanks. If you like what I do on YouTube, especially the Star Trek related stuff, you should also check out my side projects, The Ensign's Log, the Star Trek themed comedy podcast that I'm on alongside Jason Harding and Dana Cole. The three of us play characters who are low ranking Starfleet officers. We are currently on hiatus following the end of our fourth season, which makes this the perfect time to catch up. If you're not listening already, the links are in the description of this video. Please do check out the Ensign's Log. And one more thing, Jason, Dana, and I will be doing a live stream together on this channel this Saturday to talk about the show and answer your questions. The link is in the description. So if you like the Ensign's Log, be sure to join us live this weekend. I also do a weekly watch-along live stream with Dana called Trek Reluctantly, where we watch episodes of Deep Space Nine, which Dana has never seen before, and another series, or sometimes a movie, that I have never seen before. We just finished Season 2 of Deep Space Nine. On the off weeks from Deep Space Nine, we're watching the Netflix original animated series Hilda. So whenever you're able to join us, we invite you to queue up whatever we're watching on your end and watch along with us. It's every Wednesday starting at 6 p.m. Eastern on this channel right here. So if you're interested and able, please join us for Trek Reluctantly. We'd love to have you. Next month's Regulation Trek Actually topic, as chosen by my patrons and members, is an opportunity to examine another of the underappreciated characters in Star Trek. This is a character who has been vilified by fans, who has often been dismissed, neglected, forgotten about, not just by fans, but by the writers of the show. I could be talking about one of any number of characters, but in this case, I'm talking about Keiko O'Brien, who I will defend to the best of my ability in the next video, which will be called Why Keiko O'Brien is Actually Not So Bad. Looking forward to that one. Hope you are too. Thanks for watching and take care, everybody.